Hello, and welcome to this presentation on elevating your security using Block Zone Threat Defense. I'm Kripa Srivatsan, Senior Director of Product Marketing at Infoblox, focused on our cybersecurity solutions. And in this session, we're going to cover a new approach to securing an increasingly complex enterprise. We all know the typical challenges that many organizations face today. Networks are getting complex. Network demands have shifted. A lot of companies are adopting cloud, multi-cloud type environments for various reasons, including resiliency and, and efficiency and things like that. A lot of companies are also adopting SaaS as a way to, again, improve the user experience and realize efficiencies. Another thing to think about is the rollout of OT and IoT and uh, how there is a plethora of non-standard devices that are now on companies' networks. This could be anything from your standard printers to smart thermostats. It could be heart monitors, OT machines on factory floors. All of these are now connected to the network and they are increasing the attack surface and it's getting harder and harder to, to secure these type of networks and environments. What it's doing is all these changes and all these demands on the network is causing a lot of strain on security operations teams. Typically organizations as part of defense in depth deploy 25, 30 different tools, but the problem is most of those tools are siloed. They don't share data. They're good at what they do, but they don't work together in an integrated fashion to mitigate risk and help speed up incident response. The other thing to note is the cost of a data breach is continuously going up and up. The most recent security report talked about how the cost of a data breach is close to $4 million. And this includes things like not just the costs associated with mitigation, but also brand damage, lost customers, and, and things like that. And it's also taking a really long time for security operations teams to identify and contain a breach once the initial compromise has happened. The IBM security report talks about the average time to identify and contain a breach as being about 270 plus days. So that is more than three-fourths of a year that that malware has had time to dwell in companies' networks, spread laterally, and maybe even exfiltrate data. So let's take a step back and ponder over this question. What is the protocol that is used in 92% of cyber attacks? You may think maybe it's HTTP, maybe it's FTP, but in reality, the number one protocol that is used in command and control and in cyber attacks is DNS. Simply because DNS is a network element that exists in all companies' networks. It's ubiquitous. It's present in on-premises environments, in cloud environments. Remote users use their DNS for the service providers. IoT, OT devices also connect to DNS. So DNS is this ubiquitous infrastructure that is present, present uh, throughout companies' networks. Attackers know that. They know that it is an open protocol. People can you know, infiltrate malware, exfiltrate data over DNS, and, and the bad actors use that to their advantage. Another interesting fact about DNS is it is closest to the devices, not just your laptops and endpoints, but also your infrastructure devices on the network, like I mentioned earlier, printers, scanners, OT, IoT devices. DNS is kind of this first hop from any IP-enabled device. Anytime that device needs to do something, it connects to the DNS server, it makes a DNS query, and so it knows, it has that level of visibility all the way down to the end device. And the other interesting thing to note is it's a rich source of telemetry. Uh, what do I mean by that? Every device, every user, whatever resources they're accessing today, the last hour, last week, all that information is available in the DNS logs. It is stored. And so that data can provide a lot of information about what users and devices have been doing in the past. So what do we do about it? One way to think about Flipping that DNS angle we just talked about is how can you use DNS to improve security in your networks? One way to do that is to leverage a DNS-based security solution or protective DNS or whatever you want to call it 
And the one I want to talk about today is called Blocks from Threat Defense from InfoBlocks. That is a protective DNS solution that can detect malware, ransomware, data exfil, all sorts of threats using threat intel feeds, DNS-specific intel, and also AIML-based analytics to detect and block known as well as threats where you don't know whether the destination is malicious or not. So that's the solution. It's Again, it's available for your entire hybrid networks, right? You may have on-premises environments that you need to protect. You may have cloud environments. The solution is a hybrid solution. It can be deployed on-prem or in the cloud, or it's also available as a SaaS offering. And that can be used to protect your remote users who are connecting to company resources from home. And that day, their DNS traffic can be forwarded to the InfoBlock security in the cloud, and then the threat detection and policy enforcement can happen in the cloud. The other important thing to note with the Blocks on Threat Defense solution is that it is not yet another siloed tool that's sitting on your networks. It's leveraging DNS, which is infrastructure you already need, but it also can integrate with other security tools in your networks. So that could include vulnerability scanners. It includes your SIM and SOAR tools. It includes ITSM-based solutions. A very popular use case is when Blocks on Threat Defense detects a malware or ransomware activity. It can block the DNS request, but it can also trigger a scan on that device that made that DNS request to check for any vulnerabilities or malware. Another popular use case is if, you know, it can automatically raise a service not ticket, for example, um, so that the IT team now knows that that device has made a, de- a request to a malicious destination. Maybe it needs to be um, examined. So in summary, from a threat protection perspective, Blocks on Threat Defense, again, provides blocking at the earliest point of connection, simply because it's the first hop from those infrastructure and endpoint devices. We like to call this shifting left of protection, where you're even detecting the intent, you're blocking the intent to compromise. You're preventing the user from even going to a destination that could be malicious. It can be leveraged for policy enforcement. Let's say you don't want certain users to be using certain types of applications. You can block that. It also covers certain gaps in protection. So standard malware, ransomware, you know, there are many security tools that do it in a slightly different way, but they also detect malware. But there are gaps in protection, for example, things that are more DNS specific. So lookalike domains is a perfect example of threats where you need a dedicated DNS solution to detect and block that. Suspicious domains, these are domains that are spun up by bad actors, maybe weeks, maybe even months in advance of launching, let's say, a big phishing campaign. So you need threat intelligence that is looking for and proactively looking for these types of domains that are being set up in the internet, in the wild. And, you know, the suspicious domains feeds that Blocks and Threat Defense has includes those type of domains that are showing certain patterns of potential malicious activity. So you can choose to block those domains in your networks as well. We talked about protecting any system anywhere. Again, it's DNS doesn't care what type of device it is. It'll block all malicious DNS activity from those type of devices. And like I mentioned earlier, it can integrate with your entire security stack. So you get the maximum benefit of the DNS solution and you're improving the effectiveness of those ecosystem tools as well. Another thing to think about. So till now, we talked a lot about protection and detection. Now let's kind of change gears and talk about instant response. You have many tools on your networks. All of them send out alerts to your SIM tool, and your SOC is looking at these alerts. Now, the alert on the left you see on the slide gives you an IP address. Fine. It's okay. But it's not enough information for the security operations teams to start taking action. They need more information. They need to gather more data about the IP address. Okay, what type of device is it? And what part of the network is it in, right? If it's an end user device, who is it assigned to? And to get all that information, they generally do a manual effort, right? They look at different logs, they look at firewall logs. Maybe they talk to the networking team to get information about the IP address, the asset information that's associated with that IP address. All of that takes time. All of that is manual it's going to be tedious. Whereas when you do get an alert, 
let's say you get all that information already available as part of that in your SIM tool. Now that makes the security operations job a lot easier. They know the information about the device. They know if it's an end user device, they know the username. They know what part of the network it is in using VLAN information. Now they have enough to start remediation quickly without having to do a lot of the manual steps. The other important aspect for this is they can prioritize, right? If the alert is about a compromise on a CEO's laptop, maybe they want to address that first before an alert that is coming from a temporary contractor's laptop. So they can prioritize which alerts they address first because they have all this information. And all this information is coming from two related technologies called IP address management and DHCP. Before we wrap up, just a couple of quick quotes. These are customers of Blocks One Threat Defense. And here they talk about how they can look at security at the DNS layer, where the infiltration starts before letting it make its way through the network layer. And uh, they realize that they can mitigate this threat at the initial stage where it all starts. So this was a quote from one of the customers. Another quote is the problem they had was a lack of visibility. Because of the data that I talked about with IPAM and DHCP, and because we are so intertwined in the networks and we know which devices are making which queries, this customer was able to get that visibility that they were lacking initially. Another aspect to consider is the ROI for a solution like Blocks on Threat Defense. There is concrete ROI that security teams can realize. With Blocks on Threat Defense, these numbers are based on Forrester interviews that Forrester Research did with some of our customers. Security operations teams was able to reduce the total effort by 34%. There was also a reduction in endpoint downtime by 47%. And these customers said they got an ROI of 243%, and the payback period was six months. A customer case study, this was an energy and utility company in the U.S., and one of their main KPIs was to reduce their MTTR or mean time to respond. Like I said before, this is a perfect example of where security teams were spending hours, if not days, trying to get information behind an IP address. And this customer leveraged InfoBlocks to get that information faster at the touch of a button, and they were able to improve their MTTR as well. So thank you for watching this session, and I'll see you in the next one.